Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on today's webinar, The Future of Highways. I'm Dan Rizicki of the TransTech Group. Uh, this webinar is a culmination of some of the trends that uh, we have been seeing on projects that we do around the world of just interesting trends of new technologies. Um, we've uh, been delivering this as a PowerPoint recently and found a lot of interest and thought that maybe it would be interesting to do it as one of our webinars and make it available for everybody. And so that's what we're going to cover today. Uh, if you're not familiar with TransTech, we are a pavement engineering specialty firm. We've been around for 27 years, and uh, we are all pavements. So everything from pavement design and evaluation and management, uh, research and testing. Um, and we do everything from small projects for city counties to multi-billion dollar projects like design, build, and P3 projects um, all over the world. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get started. Things that we're going to cover today... Uh, we've organized this uh, webinar into three sections. First, I'll, we'll share some of the different functionalities that we've been hearing about and things that we've been seeing, test sections and projects of sort of new things that are coming to highway. So we'll give you a quick summary of those. Uh, the second part is uh, for paving contractors, we'll take a look at some of the trends that we see coming in terms of um, what are the new needs for paving contractors customers. So that would be drivers and DOTs. But also paving contractors are always having workforce shortage issues. So what do we see for paving contractor employees? Um, and then also contractor equipment and materials. And then finally, we'll wrap up with uh, highlighting some of the changes that, uh, that we hear about from our clients and changes that we see coming uh, in terms of how pavements are going to be designed and built differently in the future. So let's take a look at the future of roadway functionality. So these are just kind of some different ideas uh, of new things that are coming to highways. And you hear about all the time people talking about how in the future um, the highways will be able to uh, glow in the dark or generate their own energy or heal themselves. And that's not really the future. All those things are actually happening now. And so I'll give you kind of a quick snapshot of some of the things that, uh, that TransTech folks have been seeing on different projects that we do um, around the world. So first is uh, solar panels on pavement that generate electricity. And you've probably heard about using solar panels on pavement. Uh, the Ray is a test section on I-85 in Georgia that's co-sponsored by Georgia DOT. Wattway is a company that installed these solar panels in a rest area on the Ray. Uh, Wattway has another test section in France um, where they've installed, again, and this is what it looks like, uh, solar panels um, in a rest area. Solar Roadways is another company that does. They're based out of Idaho here in the U.S., and they have a lot of different concepts. Um, and then there's another company out of the Netherlands uh, called Solo Road, and, uh, and they've done some different test sections and some different installations. And those are kind of the, 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 the largest companies that we've come across that, uh, that are really trying to advance the state of the art in solar panels on pavement. Now, Wattway estimates that about 200 square feet of solar panel surface area generates enough electricity to power one house. And so that's kind of what proponents are talking about is it's a lot of uh, low cost electricity that uh, you know we have so much surface area that we could really be generating a lot of inexpensive energy. Critics of solar panels on pavement uh, say that actually it's very expensive to install and to maintain and to deal with the electricity management, the energy management issues that come with it. Um, and then of course there's obvious performance questions. So. Solar panels on pavement, they lead to things like friction questions or support layer issues. Um, there are the, probably some of the largest tech sections that we've heard about uh, are in China, and many of those failed in less than one year just due to the heavy traffic um, that, uh, um, uh, that destroyed the performance of the solar panel very quickly. So there's just a lot of, uh, still a lot of bugs that need to be worked out and a lot of things being debated, but, uh, but it's, it's here and it's actually happening. From the DOTs that we talked with, we've heard them say things like that they can imagine seeing solar panels in rest areas like you saw, or maybe uh, possibly someday on a shoulder, but on a main lane, it's probably going to be a long time. Meanwhile, Toyota is planning a demo road of solar panels uh, as part of a demonstration highlight at the 2020 Olympics, so that's coming up pretty soon. Here's another idea. This is uh, known as dynamic electric vehicle charging. Uh, it could also be thought of as driving your Tesla or electric vehicle down the highway as it gets recharged inductively. This is a test section in France. Uh, the equipment is built by Qualcomm. Uh, there are other test sections in Israel and also in Sweden. And actually, the Illinois Tollway Authority here in the US um, uh, just last September 
was considering a 22-mile stretch on I-294 in Chicago of exactly the same kind of installation that you're looking at right now. Um, they decided against that, but, uh, but the idea was Illinois Tollway was thinking if we could offer this as an added service to drivers, um, then it could be a whole new revenue stream for the Tollway Authority. And so that's why some different Tollway Authorities are, are looking into additional things that could generate revenue, such as inductive charging. So proponents of the idea of having uh, DEVC um, say things like, but just imagine you could have electric vehicles that just drive indefinitely, right? Like driverless cars that just go on forever if they're getting recharged by the pavement. Um, they say that also this could help with range anxiety because right now batteries, you know, don't last as long as drivers want them to. Uh, but the critics say that those points are not necessarily valid because one, the return on investment just may not be there because it's so expensive to install and maintain this kind of equipment. And two, car batteries are becoming more efficient and less expensive and the range anxiety issue may not even be around in a few years. And so they're finding that uh, uh, they believe, the critics believe that this is not necessarily such a great solution. Uh, one other idea that's been considered that seems like it might have some promise is imagine a circulator bus in a downtown area that's, you know, driving in a loop. Uh, if the pavement could be recharging that bus as it makes its loop, that could be something that, that could have some real promise. Here's another idea, uh, piezoelectric crystals that convert mechanical to electric energy. This video comes from a company out of Israel called InnoWattTech. Um, and what they're showing is piezoelectric crystals are in each of these squares, and so these are piezoelectric sensors. And the concept is when you squeeze that sensor, uh, the squeezing creates a voltage, and that voltage can convert to electricity and generate energy. Uh, so if you string hundreds or thousands of them together, drive traffic over it, then you can generate electricity that gets pushed back into the grid or gets stored or maybe lights the highway at night. So the Inawat Tech Company in Israel developed a test section in Israel back in 2009, and they've had pretty good performance. Uh, here in the U.S., the city of Merced, California, has developed uh, or is developing a 200-foot test section later on this year. And in Texas, uh, TxDOT is sponsoring a research project with the University of Texas at San Antonio uh, to look into developing a test section as well. Of course, the opponents say that the cost is just too high and the maintenance is unknown, and people in favor of piezoelectric crystals, you know, say that, hey, we're generating free energy. Oh, there's also test sections on sidewalks as well uh, that, uh, that some people have developed as well. This next idea is using uh, to look at all the different embedded sensors that are available now on pavement. So with the advent of technology and as things are getting cheaper, there's really been like a veritable explosion of new embedded sensors. So embedded sensors as a concept has been around for a while, but there's, uh, but there's now just so many more new options that are being developed. Uh, so these are just two quick ideas that we came across that we thought were pretty interesting. The one on the left is called the ePave sensor. It was developed uh, cooperatively by the University of Buffalo and a university in China. And the ePave sensor can measure temperature, humidity, pressure, and stress. And then they run that data through software that they've developed, um, and they can now predict uh, future cracks and future potholes in asphalt pavement. And they've got test sections uh, on roads right now in China uh, that are being tested and they're finding some, some early promising results. Also, the sensor uses one of those piezoelectric crystals so that every time a car drives over that sensor, it helps recharge it. So that's a pretty interesting development. On the right-hand side, you've got a sensor that is already commercially available. Um, it lasts, the battery in it is not piezoelectric, it's just a traditional battery. Uh, so it lasts about five years, the sensor costs a couple hundred bucks, and it measures uh, temperature, the presence of moisture, and then it's got a, uh, a three-axis magnetic field, sort of like a, like a wire loop at a traffic intersection to, de to detect vehicles. And so by measuring temperature and the presence of moisture and having this magnetic field, um, it can do things like count traffic or alert for traffic jams or keep track of winter weather or icing conditions uh, that are happening. And, uh, and they believe that it can actually also alert a DOT or an operation center if a, if a car or a vehicle leaves the roadway. So imagine like a winter weather accident where the car slides off the road. In theory, the sensor is going to be able to track that and, uh, and then be able to alert uh, EMS or first responders immediately. 
There is a company in Finland. This is another idea that's been that we came across and we thought was really interesting. There's a company in Finland called Vaisala, and they have uh, incorporated uh, a whole slew of different sensors and cameras uh, that are available, and you see them all displayed here. And they're using it to uh, collect data and input into sort of a nationwide, for the nation of Finland, a nationwide pavement management system. They have a contract by Sala just got uh, this past July, so July 2018, um, that they received with uh, the nation of Finland um, to basically develop sort of this real-time live pavement management with predictive maintenance uh, system. And so they've named it Artificial Intelligence uh, Road Infrastructure Management. And an interesting thing is they have, uh, they've got um, permission to bolt cameras and sensors onto the Posty delivery van. So Posty is, is their postal service for the nation of Finland. So you've got dozens, hundreds of vans that are driving around and collecting data. So it's a tremendous amount of data. It's a sort of a new development for, for pavement monitoring and predictive maintenance. Here in the US, uh, MIT is doing something that's kind of on a smaller scale, but sort of similar in concept. So MIT University has the Sensible City Lab. They've got a project called the City Scanner Project. And so in the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, they've bolted sensors onto every trash collection truck for the city of Cambridge. And so those trash collection trucks are now driving around the city measuring temperature, humidity, air quality. They're doing uh, building facade thermal imaging. And then they also have an accelerometer that measures road smoothness. And then all that data is immediately uploaded to this web app that you see here uh, that you can log into right now and see real-time live data that these trucks are collecting. And so the idea is this fleet of trucks is, is able to uh, immediately alert the local public works department um, as soon as they find potholes or rough pavement sections. And so the, the public works folks are being able to track potholes a lot more easily this way. Okay, let's talk about drones. You can't do a presentation of the future without talking about drones. So uh, there are some new applications of drones that um, uh, for things like monitoring traffic, predicting maintenance, and this video out of the University of Leeds is uh, a drone that, uh, that the university researchers have developed to fill cracks. So the drone uh, flies around, looks for a crack, lands on that crack, and fills it. That is an interesting application. Uh, other drone applications that, uh, that we're seeing. So historically, drones have not been permitted to fly over live traffic, but Ohio DOT is about to change all that. They're going to be the first DOT that will fly a fleet of drones over live traffic to monitor traffic conditions in real time. And then in Australia, we came across a company called Global Road Technology. Um, they also have offices in the U.S., but they... Um, have taken drones and bolted LIDAR onto it, which they're not the first to do that, but they are using drones flying over live traffic in Australia, and they've got uh, a whole pavement management system that is collecting video and LIDAR using a fleet of drones, and they're, uh, it's being input into their pavement management system, and then they're using it also for predictive pavement maintenance. All right, I hope you're sitting down. So believe it or not, there are researchers developing glow-in-the-dark trees to light the highway at night. Uh, researchers, at, researchers at MIT um, have identified the enzyme in fireflies called luciferase, which is what makes fireflies glow, and they've realized they can impregnate that enzyme into leaves of a plant or a tree and get it to glow in the dark for four hours. Uh, they believe they are a short distance away from being able to get those trees to glow for eight hours. Um, and their vision is to have rows of trees lighting up the highway at night. And if you think this is ridiculous, there are completely independent studies that are not related to this MIT study that are also happening in Denmark and independent studies in France. So lots of people are looking into this, um, which is pretty interesting in our view. Photoluminescent uh, striping and marking is an interesting idea. Uh, there's an artist slash engineer in the Netherlands named Dan Rosegard, um, who has uh, been very into combining art and technology. And back in 2014, he uh, had his first installation of glow-in-the-dark striping. So it's as simple as he has developed photoluminescent powder that um, mixes with the striping material and glows in the dark, as you see here. And he's not the only one who's developed this kind of technology. So there's a, there's a bunch of companies that are finding ways to 
to combine photoluminescent materials with pavement materials. So there's a company called Protec in England that has a, a photoluminescent, a glow-in-the-dark aggregate that you can mix with resin binder and apply it to pavement in a variety of different ways. Um, <clears throat> there's a prominent, uh, there's a university in Mexico in Michoacan uh, that has developed photoluminescent cement and there's a couple other places that have also developed photoluminescent cement. Um, and the city of Baltimore, uh, the DOT of the city of Baltimore has actually developed uh, glow-in-the-dark bicycle paths. So, um, so there's, there's just a lot of this photoluminescent glow-in-the-dark work that's going on. Uh, and again, this section that, uh, that you see here was installed in 2014 and so far has had a pretty okay performance or good performance is what's been reported. And of course, the cost is still pretty high, but they're coming up with ways to try to bring that cost down. Uh, another concept is using dynamic paint to alert drivers. So uh, dynamic paint is not a new concept, but this application is pretty new. So dynamic paint is paint that uh, changes color when it, uh, when it changes temperature, or that paint can sometimes be electrically charged to change color. And so the idea here is, could we paint, uh, in this case, they're using snowflakes as a demonstration, but could we use dynamic paint on pavement so that as the pavement approaches freezing conditions or freezing temperatures, that the paint would change color and, um, and be able to alert the driver that way. De-icing pavement, especially in airfield uh, uh, applications, is, has been around for a very long time. These are three of the newer things that we've come across that seem to have some promise. Um, the first one is uh, there was a research study that was done at the Binghamton Airport in New York where they're using, they're doing a, a geothermal system. So the red tubing that you see there is the underlayment under the pavement, and they're pumping, uh, piping in water from a nearby lake and they're able to use that, that higher temperature water to be able to de-ice the pavement above it, and they've had really good results so far. There is uh, item B is a product called Safe Lane, um, which is just a, a, a commercially available product, and so what they've got is uh, it's a porous aggregate application that you would put on the pavement, and that porous aggregate already has brine, uh, the de-icing brine embedded into the aggregate, so you don't have to apply it, it's already embedded, and the, the people who make safe lane say that that aggregate should last about seven cycles of being able to emit the brine to de-ice uh, pavement. And then the third application at, the, at Iowa State University um, at the Concrete Pavement Technology Center, uh, they are electrically charging concrete panels at airports and finding that that's been a very effective way to de-ice pavement at airports. So those are three applications that we've seen uh, that are new ideas for de-icing pavement. Something that's been out for a while, uh, actually, but is still new to a lot of us, is a machine-readable highway sign. So the 3M company uh, has developed infrared uh, paint that, um, that can be applied to highway signs so that an autonomous vehicle uh, would be able to read a two-dimensional barcode on that sign that would be invisible to you and me. And that way, the autonomous vehicle could get far more information than just the words, road work ahead. So for example, um, with a 2D barcode, we could inform the autonomous vehicle of things like uh, work zone location or work zone conditions or uh, wrong way indication or just other geographic information or uh, pavement markings or lane configuration. So there's just a lot more information that we could provide to an autonomous vehicle that, that could be very effective. In asphalt, uh, possible future highway materials for the US, this has actually been going on for a decade in India where they are grinding up plastic soda bottles and using it in the uh, production of asphalt um, or asphalt pavement. So, uh, so imagine grinding up soda bottles into pellets. Uh, they heat the pellet at the pug mill. Um, it is applied to the aggregate before the asphalt binder is applied. And so they coat the aggregate with this melted uh, plastic soda bottle recycled material. Um, and then apply the asphalt binder to the aggregate. And they find that by having that melted plastic layer in between the aggregate and the binder, the binder adheres much better to the, uh, to the aggregate. And they also find that they're able to reduce the quantity of uh, binder by about 10%. So they are recycling materials, uh, they're reusing materials, and they're also reducing the cost of asphalt. And again, this has been going on in India for about 10 years, and now there's a few state DOTs that are starting to evaluate this concept. On the concrete side, um, uh, self-healing uh, concrete has, is not a new concept, but using this bacteria um, that has recently been is being developed uh, has, has been sort of the newest idea in self-healing concrete. So, uh, so you're adding bacteria and an organic matter that provides food for the bacteria. 
Um, it's an organic nutrient uh, that, uh, that is added, and it's mixed in with, uh, with the concrete, and it lies dormant for up to two centuries. And then if a crack forms and moisture enters that crack, that triggers the bacteria, which uh, then produces basically limestone that fills that crack. Um, they're finding that this adds about $30 per cubic yard to the cost of concrete, so it's expensive, but of course they're developing ways to try to bring down the cost, but the performance has been really good. So those are some of the more interesting trends that we've been seeing or new technologies coming to highways. Let's move on to part two about what trends uh, have we been seeing on projects that would affect paving contractors, both asphalt and uh, concrete paving contractors. So customer needs that are evolving over time and new customers that we, the new customer needs. So drivers, we find that uh, drivers want rapid implementation of these new technologies. We're finding uh, studies that are showing that uh, Typical drivers who have these sort of level three autonomy already installed in their vehicles are increasingly frustrated that the vehicles are not seeing the road more accurately than they currently do. So we're already in this era of people already expecting uh, that their level three vehicles, it may only be a year or two old, to, to have better performance and better accuracy of being able to see the road. Also, there was a national survey done a few months ago where they, asked, where they showed that about 84% of drivers are tired, or tired of seeing maintenance and work zones during the daytime. They want all maintenance to happen at night, and they're demanding safer, smoother roads. So that's what drivers want. What DOTs want, uh, as you know, are sh they are shifting more and more risk and responsibility to contractors. Uh, funding is becoming more of a challenge because the Highway Trust Fund is just not a reliable source. And, uh, and of course, there's more uh, construction engineering inspection, more outsourcing happening to engineering and more acceptance happening uh, that's being outsourced as well. So workforce shortage. Uh, so let's talk about uh, contractor workers. So workforce shortage is uh, well known to be a major problem with all contractors. Um, and so uh, there have been some interesting things that we've come across that we thought would be uh, interesting uh, and that we have found have been helpful to contractors. So, you know, millennials, we've, um, many folks have uh, um, talked about millennials maybe somewhat unfavorably for a long time. Uh, my personal opinion is it's time for us to move on past that and really see millennials as the future of our workforce um, and see the strengths and the abilities that millennials bring. Uh, because they are now the largest generation in the U.S. workforce. They make up about 34% of the U.S. workforce. Um, also, the, uh, the average millennial is about 35 years old now, so, um, so they are not new to the workforce. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something that, uh, um, that we could be doing a better job of incorporating the needs of millennials into, uh, into the workforce and to help with workforce shortage issues. Meanwhile, um, you know, we haven't really talked about Generation Z, the generation after millennials, uh, but they are turning 23 years old, uh, the oldest Generation Z person is, so they are now entering the workforce. So it's something for us to start being more aware of. Um, and a couple of quick characteristics that are typical of Generation Z. So you're talking about a generation that actually does not remember September 11th. You're talking about a generation that has no recollection of a life before Facebook, Instagram, social media. Um, this is a generation now, not all Generation Z, but this is sort of a typical of what we see. They have more trust in social media than they do of traditional news, uh, which is an interesting development. They also rely on their mobile phone for everything from homework to applying for jobs to hand managing their finances, and they're far more diverse and they're much more connected than even millennials are. But what's interesting about Generation Z, you know, millennials uh, historically have been more focused on, on work-life balance and not as motivated by a paycheck. Generation Z is pretty different because Generation Z sees all the school debt that millennials and that their parents uh, have had to uh, handle. And so Generation Z typically is much more financially conservative than millennials. Uh, they are more interested in working for companies like contractors, which are larger companies with benefits and job security. Um, so this, all of this could be uh, some hope uh, for contractors that are facing workforce shortages because Gen Z is a little bit more interested in job security and job stability. But it's important to understand that Gen Z also is very technology dependent. Um, they, it is, we find interesting things like they tend to evaluate employers on YouTube. Uh, we're also finding that many Gen Z folks are expecting uh, what they call instant wage access, which means they want to get paid at the end of each day. Uh, so that is uh, some interesting developments. 
finally on workforce, just a few tips of things that we've seen some of our contractor friends do that seem to be helpful in, in being able to uh, alleviate the workforce shortage issue by, by having more effective recruiting and more effective retention. Um, we know a lot of uh, contractors put effort into hiring by referral, but we find that some contractors that we know who put even more effort into doing that have seen uh, good results and a good return on that investment. Also, uh, Gen Z and millennials are doing everything on their phone. So just the idea of making it as easy as possible to apply for a job by phone makes a big difference. Also, just being able to move around within your company uh, and, and offering that more outwardly to new employees is something that we've seen has had a positive response with new candidates. So think of it not as much of a career ladder as it is more of like a career lattice. And then also being able to market your firm to the generation that you're after and to the needs that they, that they perceive. So Generation X is looking for things like opportunities to grow. Millennials are interested in work-life balance and flexibility. And again, the Gen Z folks are, are very eagerly looking for uh, job stability and benefits and job security. Finally, trends that we see in paving equipment. Uh, 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 intelligent compaction is growing in popularity. We're seeing on jobs and projects that we work on uh, a lot more increase in machine guidance and the advent of augmented reality and virtual reality on projects. Uh, we're already seeing commercially available autonomous construction vehicles like crash trucks and track loaders. And then in concrete paving, uh, real-time profilers for instantly tracking pavement smoothness are becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, trends that we see in paving materials. Um, so materials that are similar to stone matrix asphalt uh, to be able to address a lack of lane wander. Um, also on the concrete side, we see more and more of performance engineered mixtures is becoming more popular and more common as that starts to roll out. Uh, and of course, just increased use of reclaimed and recycled materials. Uh, we talked earlier about so many embedded sensors. Um, and then of course, just things like uh, being able to adapt work zones to accommodate level three and four and five autonomy. Um, and then just for, uh, for major climate events and, and extreme climate events, uh, being able to develop pavements that are uh, sort of hardened infrastructure and more resilient. And then just real-time data movement uh, from work zones to, uh, from construction sites to remote uh, monitoring of, uh, of construction is becoming more and more popular. All right, so our last segment. So all of that is fairly interesting, but what trends are we seeing for changes in pavement design and construction that could be coming in the future. So these are just some of the considerations of things that are, that are gonna be happening and are starting to happen now that are gonna change the way that we design and build pavements in the future. So if we have driverless trucks, uh, they will not have as much lane wander, which means we'll have channelized loading, which means we'll probably need to change the way that we design and build pavements if we don't have lane wander. Or we need to do a better job of being able to program in that kind of lane wander into the way the trucks behave. Also, truck platooning. So we've got driverless trucks that are now going to be platooned. So reduced following distance means that the pavement response under that loading is going to be different. And so that's going to change the way that we design and construct pavements. Um, another concept is people are talking about maybe we could do narrowed lanes. Because if a typical vehicle is 8 feet wide and a typical highway lane is 12 feet wide, uh, maybe we could have narrower lanes. But of course, that then constrains uh, your ability to program in lane wander. And so that's going to accelerate the damage of the pavement, and we need to be able to design and construct for that accordingly. Some people are even talking about, you know, if an if a average vehicle is 8 feet wide and an average lane is 12 feet wide, is it possible that we could squeeze three vehicles into two lanes? So that is yet another idea that people are talking about. Also, uh, when we get to level 5 autonomy, you know, intersections are not going to require uh, thickened uh, pavement sections to prevent rutting and shoving and turning movements. Um, and so that will change the way that we design for intersections if we remove uh, uh, signals at intersections. And then as we've discussed, work zones, uh, as we have more and more road to vehicle communication, um, being able to manage work zones so that, uh, so that we can accommodate uh, autonomous vehicles and how our uh, workers uh, in work zones gonna be able to communicate with vehicles, all of those things will change the way that we handle construction practices. And then finally, if we have autonomous trucks, there will probably be increased traffic at night, and so that's going to change pavement behavior and the way we design for that. Um, major climate events, uh, as you know, are becoming more and more common, and so changing pavement design and construction for increased durability and resiliency uh, is, is becoming an issue. 
And then, of course, all this new technology that we talked about in the first segment, um, all of those things, whether it's solar panels or inductive charging or piezoelectric crystals, all of those things are, would, would influence the way that we design and construct pavement if we're going to start embedding uh, sensors and new technology in pavement. And a lot, of the, a lot of people refer to that as being what they call future-proof pavement, which is, uh, or sometimes people call it tech-ready pavement. And that's the idea of designing pavement where you make uh, available in the pavement sort of the opportunity for future installations of sensors or technology, or maybe you have conduits in the pavement where you could run fiber optic cable, or sometimes people talk about wanting to have pavement that actually emits Wi-Fi uh, and broadcasts Wi-Fi to the vehicles. And so they call it future-proof pavement of how you would design and construct pavement so that it could accommodate that. And then finally, all of these things, whether it's uh, sensors or new technology, all of it means that there's an increased need for pavement smoothness because in order for these uh, sensors and these new technologies to perform properly, we have to be able to maintain pavement smoothness over a long period of time so that, uh, so that uh, all of this technology will function the way that it should. And that's it. That's a pretty quick summary of uh, some of the trends that we've been seeing in projects that we do around the world. Um, thank you so much for making time to join us and, and hear about these things. And again, if you've got a question, uh, please use the webinar platform to ask me that question, and I'll send you an email reply right now. Thank you so much. Have a great day.